It's George here again on crazy day politically and whatever, but uh, politics will have to sort themselves out. I can't do it for them. I can't fix it. The fact is at home, I share the home with my wife so far as ownership. So I have half authority there when she lets me at the shop here, I own the joint. So I have to conform with federal, state and local law. And I have to do what's in the best interest of the company if I want to succeed and to treat my people well. But I have a lot of authority here. And the rest of the world out there, I may know how to solve virtually all of the world's problems, but I don't have any authority to act on it. So, I'll stay out of politics for today and we'll stick to guitars. At least I have some understanding of them and I have a good bit of control over what goes on here. And uh, I feel pretty comfortable here enough so that after 50 years and 10 months in business, I still enjoy coming in six days a week and work at least seven hours here and as much as 10 hours or 12 hours a day total because uh, I'm answering emails sometimes at three in the morning, usually though from about 5 a.m. to 9 or 10 p.m. is when I do most of my emails. But at any rate, we're here today. Uh, we have plenty of good questions and a uh, goodly bit of fun stuff to look at. I'd like to introduce Joe Spann on my staff. Joe works with me on appraisals. And we have a guitar that came in that while it's not something that is monetarily extremely valuable, it's historically quite interesting. And sometimes things come in that can be historically really interesting and quite significant in the history and development of guitars without necessarily having a whole lot of monetary value. There's more to collecting and more to knowledge about guitars and more that makes them interesting than just monetary value alone. So now I'll introduce Joe, here he is, and he can tell you about what he is holding. Good morning, Joe Spann here at Groom Guitars. What I've got to show you today is a really fun early silver tone electric arch top guitar. Take a good look at this. Blonde top, black sides and neck, and a really cool curly maple back. When this guitar first came in, uh, we had a kind of an animated discussion about it. We thought maybe it was something that had been put together, but uh, George tasked me with doing some research. Uh, and one of the things uh, that I started with was the Sears Roebuck catalogs. I have access to those in digitized form across the internet. Uh, and looking at it, it looked like something from the late thirties or maybe the early forties. So I looked through the Sears Roebuck catalogs from about 1935 to 1945, uh, fall, winter, and spring, summer, looking at the guitars, the silver tone guitars that were offered. And I didn't find a thing. It's not in the Sears catalogs of that time. But yet I knew that the time period was about right. Um, the guitar I suspected strongly was made by Kay. Uh, and uh, that uh, I'm drawing that conclusion from the three segment F holes, this particular type of metal trapeze tailpiece, which you often see on K guitars of the period, and also the peg head shape, very, very much K-ish. So um, we were kind of stymied uh, for just a minute looking at this thing. It's extremely well made, it's beautiful. It has, as you can see, uh, black and white binding on the edges. The finish is completely original. Uh, completely checked in the way that we would expect it to be. 
and these really cool radio style Bakelite control knobs and this unbelievable early pickup. Uh, so our next step was to, to disassemble it and take a look. And uh, we found out that the guitar was purpose built to have this pickup in it. It has not been modified. Not a thing about it has been changed since it was built. It, was, it looked like this when it came out of the factory. The pickup itself is extremely large. It's in a wooden housing with a very large magnet. It's about so deep. Uh, it, it fills up almost all the space there inside the body of the guitar. Uh, the pots dated to the uh, late 30s, uh, but we still weren't any closer to figuring out what the, what the model was and, and where it came from. Finally, I was able to find a K-built Oahu guitar that had this exact same pickup in it. We were uh, fortunate to see some, some disassembly photographs of that pickup, and it's this exact pickup. So that confirmed for us that it was a K guitar built for Silvertone, for Sears, uh, in, uh, in the late 30s, probably 1939 or 1940. Uh, we're, we're positing that because of the blonde top and back finish. Blonde finish came into vogue about 1939, 1940. Uh, and uh, the really cool, some other cool things about it, it has the early screw on output adapter here. Uh, you see that sometimes in early PA systems, microphones and things, and, and some of these early, early electric guitars. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, another interesting thing about it was the other silver tone electrics that were in the catalog had the pickup in the bridge position instead of in the neck position. Uh, so it's unique in many ways. It might have been cataloged in a Sears special catalog, something, uh, something that came out like a sales catalog, but it's absolutely not in the Sears catalogs of the period. Uh, it has the typical tuners of the time. You can see that right there, the open back nickel plated metal buttons. In every aspect, looks like a late 30s, early 40s K guitar, just with this really cool pickup uh, and, and control knobs. And the most cool thing, it still works. So there you go. Not, uh, not an extremely valuable guitar, but a really cool one. So uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to George right now. And uh, he's gonna take some more of your questions and uh, I'm sure we're gonna enjoy the show. Thanks. Okay, I'm back. I'm gonna take one question and then I'm gonna turn it over to David in repair with a couple of questions that came in for repair shop that I think are quite interesting. Um, but uh, Jeffrey says, I've read that cedar tops play themselves out after 20 or 30 years due to having less elasticity than spruce and that cedar is more brittle than spruce. Is this the case? Well, for one thing, there's different species of cedar that are used. And in general, cedar does mature pretty quickly so far as good tone. But quite honestly, my experience is that Adirondack spruce also matures very quickly. When we get new guitars with Adirondack spruce tops made by Martin, I find that uh, playing them for as little as two or three days of good hard pounding, like you would in a bluegrass or old timey band, will wake them up quick and uh, playing them very soft, just barely tickling the strings doesn't do much at all to wake them up. You can play them that way for 20 years and not much happens. But um, I don't run into a bunch of cedar guitars that are simply worn out, played out, so brittle that they aren't holding up. I see cedar guitars that are well over 50 years old that to my ear doesn't tell me that they're beyond their useful lifetime or that they're worn out and too brittle. Uh, I think that a good luthier knows how to tap tune, knows how to adjust thickness some wood such as, for example, Adirondack spruce is very hard and stiff and you can use it thinner than you might cedar. 
but that doesn't mean you can't make a good cedar top or a good top out of a variety of woods. You have to know how to compensate. Not all woods need to be the same thickness. Not all bracing needs to be the same thickness. It depends what kind of wood you're using, what kind of bracing pattern you have. But um, if you're buying a new guitar and buying, if you play one and you like the sound of a cedar top, buy it, don't worry about it. It's not going to wear out in your lifetime. So um, you can get a fine sound out of cedar. And again, it depends on which species of cedar, but uh, there's some cedar that's quite reddish in color and some like Port Orford cedar that looks remarkably like spruce and is rather white. Uh, either way, it can be fine. Um, SC says, I have a great sounding 1945 single 018. I understand this was a transition period between scalloped and non scalloped bracing. Did Martin have a modified scallop bracing during this period? Also, what neck reinforcement did they use during this war period? Ebony, question mark, the neck is rather robust. Well, in 1945, they did have ebony reinforcement in the neck. Wartime regulations prohibited use of very much metal and uh, Martin could not get the steel T-bars. Military rationing was in place. Uh, Martin discontinued scalloped bracing in late 1944 and did not resume it until 1976 with the introduction of the HD-28. So your single O guitar will definitely be a period when all of the Martins were non-scalloped bracing and uh, most still had Adirondack spruce during 1945, but it was a transition period when some had Sitka. And in 46, uh, almost everything had Sitka tops and non scalp with the exception of a few that we've run into that had four piece tops that were left over at Adirondack using up the scrap wood. Now I'd like to introduce David from our repair shop and he has several questions that have been submitted, which I feel that uh, someone from my repair shop would be better suited to answering than I would be since it is more their field than mine. One of the things about Grun guitars is I don't have to know everything. I don't have to be able to do everything. I found out as early as 1970 that while I could learn to do some operations in repair, it's a different mindset entirely. It uses the other side of the brain. And every time somebody would come in and I was trying to do a repair, if the phone would ring or somebody came in, my train of thought would pull out of the station without me and it would take enough time. I couldn't do either one of the things right. Wheeling and dealing and analyzing guitars is one side of the brain, repairing them and doing beautiful artwork is another side. And both are equally important, but the brain is not like a computer that's electrical, it's electrochemical and the chemical part of it doesn't really go where you can just flip and flop from one thing to the other. In fact, it's the sort of thing where you might have talent to do beautiful poetry and painting and also be a stockbroker or a Japanese warlord and some of them wrote poems and did painting, but they didn't do poems and painting on the battlefield. And uh, you know, you can go home, glass of wine, spend an hour decompressing and you can do beautiful artwork. And then you can go to work during the day and be a businessman, but you can't do both simultaneously and just flip and flop. You can do your business as part of the day and then turn the phone off and Spend the rest of your day doing beautiful art or repair. David does great repair. He certainly knows how, and he's articulate. So he will be able to answer a few interesting questions better than I could. So here's David. What's up, everybody? Uh, thanks for that warm welcome, George. Uh, like you said, my name is David Kriesel and I'm a repairman here at Groom Guitars. Um, we get a lot of questions about maintenance on, on, uh, on all kinds of different instruments. Um, specifically, what I'll talk about today is uh, uh, polishing your instrument and kind of cleaning your instrument. Um, we get, that's, part, that's one of the 
one of the questions we get the most, I think, um, over the phone. Um, I think it starts with what kind of finish your guitar has. Um, is it a polyurethane? Is it a nitrocellulose lacquer? Is it some sort of shellac? Well, depending on what era your, your instrument is coming from. Um, we'll start with a poly. Poly is pretty, pretty bulletproof. It's, it's, a, it's a hardened plastic. So um, you can, it's, there's so many products out there that are really great products, whether it's the Dunlop stuff or you know, Music Nomad, or there's, like, there's so many products out there that are, that are really great products. Um, I'd recommend most of them. Um, there are a few household products, but I, th I think there's um, more specific um, products out there that are, satin finishes, okay. I just got a question here about um, the difference between satin finishes and high gloss finishes. So in the short term, maybe making a copy may be more important. Maybe similar appearance could be attributed to. He's asking about the uh, the longevity between satin and high gloss. I'm not sure that there would be any um, longevity differences. Uh, the name of the game is humidifying your instrument when it needs humidifying, uh, and and not over humidifying. I think between the two, the high gloss is a little more desirable. Um, you'll find that on a little more high end instruments. Um, but you find satin on a, on a lot of great instruments out there as well. Um, but that is a great question. I don't, I, but I don't think I would lean one way or another as far as longevity or there being a different humidity. It's just a difference um, in solids and uh, solvent within the, within the finish. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. But uh, what was I saying? Okay, so we were talking about poly. Um, you know, it's pretty bulletproof. You can use pretty much anything out on the market, you know. Um, it's always good to start gentle. You know, you don't want to just get in there and really start, you know, using that elbow grease right away. Um, and a lot of people, you know, have different desires for the way they want their instrument to look, you know. And, um, a lot of people want that mojo on their guitar, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it is most important to keep it humidified. Um, but it is, if it is important to you that it is, you know, clean uh, and, and looks a certain way, I understand that as well. Um, I had a question the other day. Uh, a guy had a, a very old, uh, like 19th century uh, Germ German-built guitar, um, and he had a bunch of mold on there, and it kept the, the mold would like wipe, seem like it would wipe off, and then it would just come right back. What I recommended to him was uh, there's, there's a, a product out there you can find that has an, uh, it's, it's, it's water that's had the alkaline taken out of it. So it has a pH balance of more than 2.5. So it's an acidic water. Um, now that sounds like you're putting acid on the guitar, which is not, that's not what we're doing here. Um, what, it, what it is is a disinfectant. What it's gonna do is get in there and actually kill the mold without damaging the finish. So I've had a lot of, a lot of really good um, uh, you know, success with that, with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as polishing your guitar, you, you know, you want to disassemble, take the strings off, kind of disassemble everything. If you really want to get in there, uh, toothbrush is useful. Um, a good, you know, felt, you know, uh, polishing cloth, uh, maybe with, without something on it. Um, you got a question. I got a question. Um, yeah. All what right. Are, what are your thoughts on using lemon oil on a uh, rosewood fretboard? Sure. That's a, 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 a age old uh, way of cleaning fretboards. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, it's very, you know, it's not going to hurt the fretboard at all. Not going to hurt your finish. Um, but yeah, that, that, that is a, um, a product that's been used for a very long time to finish uh, or to, to clean fingerboards. Absolutely. It's a great I'm question. Sure they heard about that one. They heard about oh, okay. Well, the question was, um, what can you use lemon oil for fingerboards? And like, like, like I said, absolutely. That's a, one of many great products that you could use for a fingerboard. Absolutely. Um, as far as nitrocellulose, uh, that's where you, you got to watch out for solvents. And uh, also silicone is a big one. You got to watch out and look up the chemical makeup of the of the product and make sure there's no silicone in there because that's that's a big deal. You can do some strange things to the finishes. Um, and then if it's shellac, 
that's that's even more fragile still. Uh, you'll find that on, on much, much older instruments. And I'm sure there's some builders out there still using it. Um, that I might talk to your local luthier about that, uh, about cleaning that. Um, just so you don't, you know, accidentally use something or, you know, make a mistake and, and, and hurt your guitar. Because we don't want to do that. Um, French polish is shellac. Right, right. <clears throat> yeah, you want to, it's, it's a, it's a, they're very fragile. The French polish is, is a shellac, so. Um, I also got a question here from Rob. He says, I just purchased an Epiphone Masterbuilt DR500MCE. I'm learning the basic campfire chords to start, and I'm currently practicing my chord changes and strum patterns based on my current skill level. What would you suggest I set the string action to? I'm going to um, kind of telescope that, that question uh, because it's a, it's a bigger question than just the string height. Um, basic, well, you should, you should take it to your luthier and have it set up properly. Um, but the way action kind of works is it all starts with the truss rod, if there's a truss rod at all. Um, start with a truss rod, get that to where you like it, and then you bring down the string action to where you like it, and then you bring down the nut slots. And I find that the nut slots are specifically effective in making your guitar feel the way you want it to feel. Um, but you do know you do need to know what, what you're looking for so you don't go past and you know once you go once you you know, file past that point, um, you're gonna get a real bad buzz on your, on your guitar and then you're gonna be really uh, bummed out. Um, but yeah, as far as string action, um, you know, our, our spec is, you know, 330 seconds and 230 seconds. Um, on, on acoustics, that's, a, that's an acoustic instrument. On uh, electrics, it's uh, 564 and uh, 230 seconds. Um, but you know, there's there's some leeway in that, and there's different. Um, gosh, there's, there's different reasons why you might want to go even higher. You do get a little more push on the top or drive into the, the top of the acoustic instrument if you have a little higher action. If you can get used to it and, and really work up those calluses and, and those hand muscles, um, it's, it's uh, you can really get a lot more tone out of your instrument that way. But again, that's something you should talk with your local, uh, you know, repairman about. Um, and just tweak it, tweak, mess around with it. You know, like these, these guitars are not, what we do is not magic, you know, and there, there is definitely some, some science to it, you know, but um, it's always good to, I think, talk to someone about, about these things. Um, instead of, you know, getting yourself in a position where you, you don't want to be. So, um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much, all my questions. Uh, you think that's enough, George? That should do it. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Now we have one more question that I'm going to bring Lynn Croson from our repair shop on regarding some fender questions. And then I will be back to complete the presentation of further questions. Hi, I'm Lynn, and I've been asked the question about dowels on pre CBS fender bodies, and do they appear on any later fender Stratocasters? And I'm not exactly sure um, with the way that this question is worded, if I'm answering the correct question or not, but I'm just going to answer. Um, and the dowel marks, I guess he's talking about the dowels that are uh, on the body where they fill the holes from the uh, routing templates. So there's one on Stratocasters that is a template for the top route and a template for the back route. And you'll see uh, dowels where they fill the holes where they screwed those in. And those uh, do appear all the way into the 70s. Uh, they started doing them on Telecasters from the very, uh, I guess Broadcasters, Esquires from the very beginning. And they used them all the way up and through the, the 70s. And uh, I think it probably stopped when they started using uh, more automated uh, body routing systems. So those were on the pre CBSs and uh, the, the post CBSs. Um, also, um, just to cover this as well, 
on the, the pre-CBS instruments, they used nails to actually hold the body while doing the finish. So they would uh, place the body on the back, spray the top finish, and then flip it over onto the nails where they would finish the rest of the, the finish work on it. And uh, those were used all the way from 1950 all the way up until uh, 64 when they started doing their, their prank. I started in 63, they started phasing them, but uh, in 64 they were gone. And they started using a paint stick so that they didn't have to flip the bodies over like that. They could actually hold the body and uh, spin it around and be able to do the whole finish that way. So that's when the, uh, the paint stick started coming in play in the, the neck pocket was uh, 63. And uh, they still used the nails for a, a little bit of time there while they figured out how to make the, uh, the, I guess the fixture to hold the bodies while letting them dry. So there you go. There's uh, a couple of questions there. That's the, the answers to that. So thank you all. Here's George. All right. Um, we have a question from Jeffrey. It says, I have wondered if a guitar takes on the acoustic characteristics of its player. Here's an extreme example. A person plays a guitar softly every day for 10 years using only three chords. Imagine that the same guitar is played every day in a bluegrass band for 10 years. In one instance, the range of frequencies the wood was exposed to was wide ranging and intense, and the other limited and soft. Would not the wood change based on the frequencies it was exposed to? So in the end, the very same guitar would sound very different depending on what it was exposed to. I'm not talking about opening up, I mean permanent change for better or worse. Um, I understand the question and it's certainly uh, not the first time I've heard this. There are players who feel that the guitar takes on their personality. And I've even encountered some people who don't want anyone else to play their guitar for fear that it will get bad vibes in it. <laughs> And uh, I do not subscribe to that theory. Uh, my experience is that a guitar does need to be played to get it warmed up and to get it broken in. And that even a few days or a few hours of hard playing on a guitar that had brand new will significantly change its response for the better and that on instruments that you play regularly, it also makes a difference to give it a bit of warm up when you start to play. Play it hard for a few minutes and you'll find that it opens up and is responsing, is the response is improved. And then you can play soft, medium or loud. And you can play with dynamic range, but it's good to wake it up. It does matter. Uh, so, is it going to really change the nature of the guitar in a way that is permanent? Uh, my experience is no. I've had some instruments that were 50 plus years old, even as much as 80 years old, that hadn't been played hardly at all in their entire life and looked almost new and they sounded somewhat asleep. But with a few days of playing, they woke up and did extremely well. And quite frankly, did just as well as some that had been played heavily for just as many years. Um, also, you find that there's certain types of tones that uh, players, some players like flamenco players prefer a guitar that's relatively new. Uh, if it's too mellowed in, it doesn't sound quite as crisp and percussive as they like. So players like Sabicas, who was a well-known player back in the 50s and 60s, Spanish flamenco player, uh, preferred to have guitars that were not much over a couple of years old. Uh, but he had no problem with that because if he played one for two or three years, some of his fans would buy it from him for more than he paid for it, and then he could go out and get another one. But um, at any rate, the uh, fact is that it... Uh, 
does change tone when a guitar is played, but is it going to pick up your vibes in such a way that it couldn't be played by somebody else just as well, or that it's permanently changed in a way that may be great or not so great? In my opinion, the answer to that is no, it's really not an issue. It can be played not at all, it's simply in storage for many, many years. And if it's set up in proper playing order and played hard enough to wake it up, that it will respond very well and very quickly. Uh, so break in time is important, but it's not that you have to play it for 30 years and that it's going to sound dramatically different than if the guitar is the same age and has been unplayed for 50 plus years. If you then play it, it wakes up just fine. The L5 guitar that I've spoken of that I got recently that I paid $50,000 for hadn't been played much at all in its lifetime because the woman who sold it to me was 87 years old. Her father bought the guitar new in 1924. He died when she was five years old. The guitar went into the closet. And when I got it, it was really good sounding, but it still needed a little bit of waking up. And after playing it for less than a month, the thing just woke up and is wonderful guitar and still is my all time favorite guitar of every guitar I've ever owned or even every guitar I've ever played. I've never seen a guitar owned by me or anybody else that suited me as well as this one. And that means I've seen in the course of my lifetime, hundreds of thousands of guitars. I don't know if I've seen a million guitars or not. I certainly haven't got to sit down and play a million guitars, but I'm sure I've played personally more than 100,000 guitars over the years that I've played, if only for a minute or two. And I never, ever played one that spoke to me the way that particular L5 does. At any rate, um, you can, that's what I think on that topic. Scott says, I have a 2007 Martin D18VE. Uh, that particular model came with aging toner on the top. I've noted your distaste for torification and I was wondering if aging toner was just a cosmetic thing or if it has an effect on tone. The answer is the aging toner has no impact on tone. It's just a little bit of stain in the finish and it's not going to alter the sound of the guitar. Uh, some of the aging toners to me are just too yellow and resemble jaundice. And my dad was a pathologist, so I don't consider jaundice to be a good color. Uh, I prefer a non-stained top unless it's going to be sunburst finish and then just let age and uh, a bit of exposure to UV light do its thing and uh, give you natural aging color, which is not quite as yellow. I have seen though some aging toners that look remarkably close to natural aging, but I do like this, there's a difference in look too between wood that's stained yeah. with the stain applied direct to the wood or stains that are in the lacquer. Uh, if it's a hand rub stain applied to the wood and then it's lacquered or varnished, there's a look that it has more clarity and more depth to it. And it does look different from the stain that is in the finish. So it makes a difference in that, but at any rate, the answer to your question is, will it impact, will the stain impact the sound of the guitar? The answer is no, it won't. Um, I have a question from Joe. Do you consider Paul Reed Smith the best or among the best mass produced electric guitars on the market today? And what are your thoughts about the collectability and value of early PRS customs? Well, the early PRS guitars that were made in 1985 and 86 are quite collectible and do bring high prices. Uh, most of the later ones are priced more uh, based on utilitarian appeal. Uh, PRS guitars are very high quality. Uh, they have a personality, a look, feel and sound that is not the same as a Fender or a Gibson. They are their own thing. And it's a good thing. 
Um, my experience with PRS is that most of my customers are not interested in paying a especially high price for PRS's collectibles unless they are 1985 or 86 and beyond that, they're priced as very good utility guitars, but they are very good utility guitars. They play well, they sound good, they look good, and they are quite versatile. So I'm in no way trying to badmouth PRS, they're fine instruments. And um, for uh, Thomas Van Tilburg, what is your opinion of a De Cristo guitar? Well, Jimmy De Cristo was the apprentice to D'Angelico. When D'Angelico died in 1964, Cristo finished out the few guitars that were in progress and then started making guitars on his own and took over the shop. Uh, he is considered to be one of the finest modern jazz guitar builders in the history of the instrument. Uh, he died in 1995. Uh, his instruments are very, very high quality. Um, you know, there are some De Cristo design guitars that have been made since his death, uh, including some in Japan. They are not to be confused with the ones that he personally made. The ones he personally made are extraordinarily fine guitars, uh, highly revered by jazz players, and I'm sure will be highly revered uh, for well beyond my lifetime. They are very, very fine instruments. Um, I have a uh, question from Ron Kaufman. Could you make some suggestions for long-term storage of electric and acoustic guitars? With COVID, I'm not playing nearly as much and the electric guitars rarely get out of the case. What is the best practice for storing them and what additional things should be done for winter storage? Well, for one thing, winter storage and summer storage are different insofar as, depending on what part of the country you're in, you're likely to be using air conditioning in the summer and heat in the winter. And here in Tennessee, in the summer, it's quite humid. You know, in the summer, if you're in Arizona or Colorado uh, in the high desert and the higher the altitude is also in general, the drier the air tends to be. Uh, you go to uh, Telluride, Colorado, and if you were the previous day in Panama City, Florida uh, or Miami, uh, your guitar is likely to go nuts. <laughs> it's going from high humidity to low humidity. And if you're a musician playing an outdoor gig in Key West, Florida one day and Telluride, Colorado the next, you better have a good technician with you because your guitar, things are gonna move. And it's also not really good for your guitars. You might even seriously wanna think about getting a graphite guitar that has no wood in it. Right. You know, we sell uh, some of those uh, McPherson brand. But you can heat them to 140 Fahrenheit. It won't hurt them. You can take them to 40 below zero. It won't hurt them. You can take it to the beach and the salt air won't hurt it, although it's not the best for electronics. It's if you have good. a pickup on it. But um, it's uh, plugged in, they sound pretty good. And acoustically, they're not too bad. But um, I wouldn't recommend taking a 1931 OM28 Martin and play it one day in Miami sitting on the beach. Uh, I wouldn't take it there any time of year if I had. That's not the guitar to take to the beach. <laughs> uh, and uh, I wouldn't take it as a professional road musician to tour where you're going to have dramatic changes, but winter and summer in Tennessee, and for that matter, even where Martin guitars are made, Nazareth PA, the changes are considerable. Now, if your wood is well seasoned, it is more stable 
and it is less likely to expand and contract radically with changes in humidity than wood that is newly cut and then kiln dried. Uh, the stuff may still get down to the moisture content where it's supposedly right, but it's not chemically stable. It's not structurally stable. It's sort of like if you take a soda straw and you scrunch the paper down, it's this tall, and then you drop some water on it, it wiggles and squirms like a worm. And, um, but if you leave it, if you scrunch it and leave it scrunched that way for a year, and then you hit it with a drop of water, it doesn't do near as much. It uh, has stabilized and chemically changed. The you know, paper changes quicker than wood. You know, if it's non-acid free paper, uh, that stuff ages quickly. Like you, know, you take a newspaper and by the time it's a month old, it's already getting brittle. And um, wood is a little bit like that too. Well-seasoned wood is more stable. How did Martin build guitars where they were stable enough that they could give a lifetime warranty when they didn't even have humidification equipment in the factory? Well, they could slop some water on the floors a bit to help bring humidity up, but they still didn't have dehumidification in the summer. Uh, equipment of that kind hadn't been invented yet. So today, a lot of the guitars are made with kiln dried wood, but they still have to season it beyond that or it's not really stable. But when you're storing a guitar, if you're gonna store it for months on end and not play it, there's no reason for it to have string tension on it. On an acoustic guitar with medium gauge strings, you'll have at least 150 pounds of pressure on it. That's like putting braces on a kid's teeth. You leave it that way for years on end, things move. If you're not gonna play the guitar, slap the strings and keep it in a humidity controlled environment where the humidity ranges from about certainly not less than 40 percent 45 to 50 percent is really ideal humidity and when it goes into the 30s you're going to have problems with your guitar going out of whack and when you go to telluride colorado to play a festival the humidity is nowhere near 30 percent it's much less and if you go to some desert areas, it's not only hot, it's dry. And um, in the winter in Tennessee, if it's below freezing outside, the amount of water in the air is very little. Relative humidity can be 50%, but 50% humidity when it's 35 degrees is not at all the same as 50% humidity when it's 80 or 90 degrees. At 90 degrees, the air can hold a tremendous amount of humidity. And if you bring that into a building and you air condition it, you'll see sometimes condensation on the windows and, it's, and the air condition is also dripping water out. It's removing quite a little lot of water, a lot of water because you bring that down and the water condenses, it's gotta go somewhere, the air can't hold it anymore. But when you take air from outside in the middle of the winter, and if it's, it can go down below freezing here, if you bring that air inside and you heat it to 70 degrees, all of a sudden you now have extreme dry condition where the relative humidity is not especially much more than it is in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Especially if it's below freezing outside, the air has virtually no water in it. So that is important. We have to humidify in the winter and dehumidify in the summer, but not every area of the country is like that. But so far as long-term storage, if you have the humidity right and there's no slack, if you slack the strings, what else do you have to do for storing your guitar? The answer is nothing else. That's all you gotta do. It's stable. And the same can be said if you have a guitar that has damage, has cracks and other things, or it's been an accident, the first thing you do is slack the strings, especially since if it has a crack, it's going to pull apart if it's structurally compromised. The other reason also to slack strings, even if your guitar could handle it, suppose something goes wrong, like a brace comes loose or the bridge starts to come loose and you don't open the case for a year, then you open it up and oops, it's a real mess. It's pulled wood with it. It's cracked the top. 
It may have yanked wood, or sometimes we see where a bridge has pulled loose and it's actually pulled wood off the top. It can be extreme damage to the top. If you catch it early, you won't have a problem. You just slack the strings. Well, if you slack the strings when you put it in storage, it's not gonna pull loose, but you don't ever want to leave strings at full tension on a guitar that you're not gonna be looking at from months on in. So that's basically what there is to know about storage of guitars. Um, uh, Marshall Cohen says, now that you're going down this road, ever played a James Olsen? Well, yeah, we've had a number of Olsen guitars. Uh, one of the most famous people using Olsen guitars is uh, James Taylor. Uh, and Olsen makes some very fine guitars and Taylor really likes those guitars. On the other hand, he also, I've heard him in one video where he was commenting that the guitars really wear out so that you, you, know, you have to get new ones periodically. And uh, I don't subscribe to that theory. I've got guitars that are way older than I am. I'm 75 years old. And uh, some of my favorite guitars are a little bit older than me and uh, they ain't worn out. But uh, for those who like the sound of James Taylor's guitar, he does get a fine sound, but not very many people have actually heard the sound of his guitar. What you hear is a recording, or if he's playing live and you're sitting even in the front row, you're hearing sound that's coming out of speakers and uh, you'll notice that there's a wire coming out of his end pin and uh, he's got a pickup and that goes into a mixing board and he may have pedals. By the time you have a pickup and pedals and a mixing board and a power amp system, and then that goes into the house speakers, you didn't hear his guitar. You heard sound waves that have been highly processed. Or if you have every recording he ever did, well, he might have plucked that string 20 years ago, but it went into a microphone and a mixing board and it was processed on tape. And then that tape later was either put onto vinyl when it then has to wiggle a needle, which goes into an amplifier system and you have all the adjustments you can do and it may sound very pretty, but did you actually hear his guitar? I think the word is obviously you didn't hear sound waves generated by his guitar. If he plucked the string 25 years ago, you didn't hear his guitar. Uh, he's a fine player. He does great music. I'm not criticizing what he does, but uh, do I like Olsen guitars the way I like pre-World War II Martins or Gibsons or even my brand new Martin Sinkers, the answer is no, I don't. And I have owned some and uh, not personally where they were my guitar, they were the shop's guitars that we had either on consignment or here. And they're very good, but do I think that they are something that makes Martins or Gibsons obsolete? The answer is no. Uh, but for any guitar here, I hope, great performer, no matter how good the guitar is. It may be fabulous, it may not be fabulous acoustically, but sometimes electric acoustics don't have to sound great acoustically, they just have to sound good plugged in. And I've heard instruments that I thought recorded beautifully, but when I played them live, they just didn't do anything for me. Uh, it also depends on just how you mic it. Do you shove a mic three inches from the guitar or Yasha Heifetz, one of the greatest classical violinists ever of the first half of the 20th century. Fabulous player. He didn't want a mic any closer than 10 feet from him. And um, the fact is some of the best mics in the world are also not modern. Some of those pre-World War II Neumann mics have never been equaled yet, or maybe they've been equaled, but they haven't been surpassed. The fact is recording technology has changed, but some of the best microphones are quite old, but still there were no great microphones in 1920. When my L5 Gibson was made in 1924, 
PA systems were not there. People were playing live and the guitar had to be loud. And the, some of the singers for the early crooners, like Rudy Valley, used a, mi a megaphone, not a microphone. Jolson. Jolson. Al Jolson also did that. And the jazz singer, while it was a sound movie, had like three minutes of synchronized sound, but it wasn't even the modern type. It wasn't really a talking movie. It was, it was a silent movie that had subtitles for all but about three minutes of synchronized sound for singing. It wasn't well enough synchronized that you could talk and have the lip movements quite right, but you could synchronize it good enough that the singing part sounded okay. But otherwise theaters, movie theaters had live musicians for soundtracks. And when talking movies came out, it put a whole lot of musicians out of work. All the guys who played in the theaters were plum out of luck. They was out of work. Um, we had a question from Chow Pivik uh, about satin finishes, and David did mention some about that. But uh, one thing I would say about satin finishes is they tend to be very thin, which is acoustically very good. And actually there are some rather inexpensive guitars with satin finishes that I think sound incredibly good. Uh, the Martin DSS-17 is a great sounding guitar. And if it had gloss finish, I don't think it would sound as good. And there are some Seagull guitars, uh, they're uh, solid wood series, and they say SWS solid wood series on them. And some of those are remarkably good guitars that are satin finish and really sound better to my ear than the more expensive version that they do with the gloss finish. But another thing about satin finish is if you polish them vigorously, you can sort of de-satin them and make them a bit glossy, but since they're laid on really thin, if you do that too much, you're gonna run out of finish. But uh, satin finishes are sufficiently durable to be no real problem. And uh, so far as sound, uh, they're very good. It's, a, it's also a process that's much cheaper to do than a gloss finish. Um, but, um, A couple of other questions that have come in. Um, a guy named George, that's a name I can remember since I'm <laughs> George too. I came across a couple of parlor guitars along with some banjos from the early 1930s made by Slingerland. The models were called Maybell. I assume this is the same company that is well noted for their drums and percussion. Slingerland went on over the years making their trademark drums and the guitars seemed to fall by the wayside. Did they just try their hand at guitars? It stopped making and producing guitars and banjos years ago. Is there any value to them or is it more like collecting memorabilia? Well, Slingerland banjos uh, were made by the same company that did the drums. And if you think about it, drums and banjos have a good bit in common. They got a circular body and they got either a hide or a plastic head. You tighten the head and in a way, a banjo is like a drum with a neck and strings on it. And Leedy was another drum company that also made banjos. And the Slingerland banjos, uh, the Maybell brand ranged from some very inexpensive student models to some that were quite expensive. And uh, some of those actually uh, can bring several thousand dollars for the really, really high end ones, or at least they used to, tenor banjos, uh, have one thing in common, they were designed for Dixieland banjo. And most of the people who really enjoyed and played Dixieland have another thing in common today. They're dead. Um, <laughs> Dixieland was popular in the 1920s, and barely a bit into the 30s. It had a revival in the 70s on into the 80s with retirees who grew up with Dixieland when they were of dating age. But the tenor banjo market is pretty anemic at this time. There was a brief period when some of the really top, top end Slingerlands could bring as much as $3,500, but I think it might be hard to get much over $1,500 for some of those same instruments today. But Slingerland did make guitars. They were in Chicago and they made Maybell brand. It wasn't named after Maybell Carter. It was 
independent. And Maybell Carter was in the name was an E, and uh, Maybell brand was B E L L, no E on the end of it. But um, one of the interesting things is, though, that there was the Slingerland guitar, electric lap steels, and a matching Slingerland solid body electric round neck, Spanish neck guitar in their 1939 catalog. And that guitar is a solid body electric, round neck, Spanish neck guitar designed not to be played as a Hawaiian. And it predates Les Paul's Law. It predates Bigsby. It predates any other solid bodies other than perhaps AudioVox in Seattle. AudioVox was also doing solid body electric guitars, lap steels, and even electric basses, fretted electric basses in the 1930s and doing amplifiers. Now AudioVox is a very obscure company, but when it said that Leo Fender is the first one to ever make an electric fretted bass, wrong. <laughs> AudioVox did it first. And uh, did Les Paul make the first ever solid body electric guitar? Wrong. <laughs> Slingerland and AudioVox did it first. And for that matter, in 1936, uh, Rickenbacker had a Bakelite electro model. Uh, they had the lap steel and they had a matching round neck model. And it had some hollow chambers, uh, some holes in it that were covered by metal plates simply to reduce weight, but it functioned as a solid body instrument. It was absolutely not acoustic at all. And there's pictures of Les Paul with one of those before he did the log. So Les Paul was well aware of that. And the earliest uh, prototype Rickenbacker frying pan lap steel had a round neck and regular frets and there's even fret wear on it so that they obviously knew it could be played either way because there's clear evidence that the prototype, which Rickenbacker still has on display, has some playing wear that was clearly not Hawaiian style. So they knew it could be done. Was that California? And uh, yeah, Rickenbacker was in the uh, Los Angeles area. Um, and so Rickenbacker, in fact, uh, also uh, was involved with building, he had a metal shop, and he was involved with building the first metal body national guitars. And um, wow. so it's, uh, he went into business on his own later, but, uh, but uh, this is something where he got, he was working with George Beecham on the electro lap steel and Beecham had also been involved with National. And uh, so there's ties that go together there. Um, John Zimmerman says on my 12 string acoustic, if I'm not gonna play it for a while, should it be tuned down or do you leave it in tune? Well, again, that's where, depends how long it's gonna be that you're going to be playing it or not playing it, but if for months on end, you're not gonna be playing it, then that is something that you should tune down, especially on a 12 string with a lot of tension. Uh, Dave Farrow, I have several newer Martins and love all of them, however, I've never bought a Martin guitar over the years it didn't, that I didn't think was in need of being set up to be properly playable. I know you've mentioned it in the past, that 70s Martins didn't uh, set their guitars up, uh, feeling that the guitar, that was the guitar job of the retailer. Do you feel that is still the case with Martin? And what about other builders? New Martins are set up in good playing order. They don't need a bunch of setup in most cases. Um, they're set up remarkably well. We don't have to do much setup, but some players will ask for something different um, so they plaque it's them. there. They're plucking them. Right? They're, they're plucking them. Um, I'd like to bring Kim Salstrom on. I have one more question, and I'm going to bring him on. <laughs> My friend Jim okay. Salstrom is here. Hi, George. And I'm going to bring him on. Um, 
Joshua Abelson asks, how do we like GNL guitars? GNL labels fine guitars. Uh, GNL was George Fullerton and Leo Fender. And uh, Leo later sold the company. But uh, when Leo sold Fender to CBS, he got bored. And for a while he did Music Man brand, sold that, and then he did GNL. So that was how GNL guitars got started. But uh, they're good guitars. Are they highly collectible? Do they bring premium prices from collectors? No, but are they good utility guitars? Suitable for use on stage professionally? Absolutely, yes. And bang for the buck, they're good. Uh, I'm gonna bring Jim Salstrom on. Jim is somebody I've known for a number of years. He has quite a history in the industry uh, with, uh, well, you can say who you played with, John Denver, Dolly Parton, and he's got a guitar he just acquired recently that he can chat about, but also just... Uh... It's great to see you, George. It's nice to be here in Nashville. And the mural, if you haven't seen the mural on the side of the building at Gruen Guitars, it is a work in progress. And I just met the artist and it is fabulous. It is just so cool. It's got the tree of life on the mandolin and it's got a D45. And this is a D45 that um, I acquired up at... Um, Music Villa in Montana, in Bozeman, Montana, and it's a koa. And I'm just so excited to get to show this to you because you've seen them all and you've probably seen one like this, but uh, I had not. Now, I assume that on the neck block it's stamped custom rather than it, D45. It, it says custom shop. Because when you look at it, it's actually not the D45. Is that right? Well, it's got the trim on the body, top, right? Alloni, sides, sides alloni, back. Abalone, the ornamentation on the body is exactly like a D45. On the other hand, the ornamentation on the neck is not. This is the diamonds, slotted diamond inlays like you'd see on a style 28 pre-war or you know, the HD 28 now has inlays like that. You mean I have to take it back to the music and villa and the give it back to The peg head is not a D45 pattern. It has the same inlay pattern on the 50th anniversary Gruen model with the decal in abalone. And this is the finest quality abalone. This is oh, very, yeah. very highly colored, beautiful abalone. So this, this is a more elaborate inlay than you get on the D45. Is that right? And it has, uh, these are the uh, engraved. engraved gold plated Waverly tuners. Oh, show it like that. <laughs> and we can show it, get it just close up. I'll just get it where you can really see that peg head. Let's so you don't think it's a 45? I mean, it says it's a custom. It's a custom. And that just means that when it's not in the catalog, right. catalog specs, it's a custom ordered guitar. Yeah. Uh, it would have cost as much as a style 45. And the, the inlay on the body is style 45. Right. It's actually more colorful inlay. It's higher grade abalone, specially selected for their most colorful, it really pops. And the same on the inlay here, that's, that's actually fancier than you'd get on a D45. Is that right? And the standard new D45 doesn't have as colorful abalone as that. This is custom shop. So anything that's not standard catalog specs, if you custom order it, it's stamped on the neck block custom. custom right. So it's certainly influenced by 45 design, <laughs> but this fingerboard inlay is not at all 45. Right. Well, I think somebody, you know, just kind of went to town with yeah, the custom they, shop. You know? Yeah, it's a custom shop. Yeah. It's absolutely the quality of a 45 in every way. It's a pretty guitar. It's, not, it's balanced. It's, it's uh, well balanced. And uh, um, I'm really proud of the fact that I'm a Martin nut. I'm a Martin artist. And uh, if you have not come to Gruen Guitars, I'm going to do a little sales pitch here. He makes these incredible sinker mahogany guitars that come from the custom shop. Well, I don't make them. Well, he has them order made. Them. He orders them. But they are fabulous guitars. And uh, also, I'm a big fan of the new DSS-17 Martin. And uh, you just if you make a pilgrimage to Gruen Guitars, you got to get a picture of the mural on the outside of the building. The artist is working hard at it right now. I just met Ron, he's really cool. 
And this is just a place that it's, I'm a kid in a candy store when I get to come to Nashville and, and hang out with you for a little bit. And I always learn something. I didn't know Slingerland had made the first electric solid body guitar and- uh, Well, actually audio box and or audio were box. doing it at about the same time. But you always learn something and these are incredible podcasts. And uh, uh, I hope everybody out there is having a safe, warm day. It's beautiful here in Nashville and it's great to see you. And uh, I should be quiet now. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, uh, we've had a good time. And uh, we've. Do you had... want to hear a little bit, just a tiny Absolutely. bit? Absolutely. Like... Yes. My older brother would say, practice at home. You should bring Titus out here. In the morning, by this up, this Nashville view. Get me up in the morning, can't get enough of being here at good. You got a special way of saying good morning. I know a special place the sun is warm and fine. In Nash, Vegas, Tennessee, on a Friday morning, Sarah, Eric, and George, and Titus. It's a nice sound. Do you like it, George? I do indeed. Until next week, have a good one. We live in interesting times. Hopefully by next week, we'll know who's going to be the next president. You should be, George. I wrote your name in. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.